Good afternoon, everyone, and everybody online who's joining us. Um, my name is Andre Moda, and I'm the head of biodiversity and forests at IGES, the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. And this is a session on the IPBES uh, assessment on invasive alien species. Uh, for this session, we have um, two sections or two sort of mini parts. Uh, one of it is uh, looking at the input from uh, experts from the assessment, one of the three co-chairs, and also one of the coordinating lead authors of one of the chapters of the assessment. And then we're also going to be speaking to some policymakers, one from Japan and one from Indonesia. I'm going to introduce everybody uh, later as the sessions come up, otherwise it's too much information at once. Um, but for now, I just wanted to mention that um, what we'll do is after uh, we hear from the two experts, we'll have a short discussion just between myself and the experts. And, and then the policymakers will have their uh, short presentations. I'll have a short chat with them. And then after that, uh, for the last 25 minutes or so of the session, we'll open to the floor for questions and have a more uh, spread out and open uh, conversation. So that's the basic format. Um, one, two quick uh, admin points. One is uh, if you have questions on Zoom, if you're listening on Zoom and you have questions, please uh, put them into the Q&A box at any stage. You can start right now if you like. Um, so it doesn't have to be right at the end of the session. At any stage, you can do that. Um, and then actually my other bit of admin, I think I'll mention at the end, it's a reminder to join us at the for the five o'clock uh, session, but I'll remind you uh, again at the end. So for now, I would like to hand over to Amako-san, who's the head of the technical support unit for the IPBES assessment on invasive alien species, which is hosted uh, by IGES at our Tokyo Sustainability Forum uh, here in, in the, or next door in Tokyo. Amako-san, over to you. Thank you so much, Andre-san, for your kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity. Uh, my name is Naoki Amako, and I'm the uh, head of the technical support unit uh, for the invasive alien species assessment. I mean, uh, IPES uh, assessment. And for well, and for those of you who are not familiar with uh, IPES, uh, it is an acronym standing for Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And, it's a, uh, and it is an independent intergovernmental body established in 2012 to strengthen the science policy interface for biodiversity and ecosystem services for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, long-term human well-being, and sustainable development. And the work of IPES can be grouped into four areas, which are assessments, policy support, building capacity and knowledge, and communications and outreach. Our particular uh, technical support unit, or the TSU, has supported one of the assessments, uh, which is the thematic assessment of invasive alien species and their control. And this uh, and the the outcome uh, document, uh, the assessment report, was de uh, was developed over four years and uh, by a multidisciplinary team of 86 experts and many contributing authors. And it was launched in September this year. I am quite honored to have worked with all these experts and it is our greatest uh, privilege to have two of the experts here in this session, uh, namely Helen, one of the co-chairs and Sankaran, one of the coordinating lead authors. And this TSU is hosted by the IGES, and it is also supported by the Minister of the Environment of Japan. Taking this opportunity, I would like to thank IGES and the Minister of the Environment uh, for their support. I hope this session will be a good opportunity to consider the implications of the assessment report for Asia and to help make an impact in this region. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, uh, Amako-san. So that was just a, a very brief um, introduction to the assessment and its report. Uh, all of the presentations are going to be pretty short because we wanted to have as much time for discussion as possible. Um, so the same goes for the, the following presentations, but you'll hear for about uh, 10 minutes or so from both of the experts that Amako-san uh, just introduced. Um, I'm going to introduce them both at the same time because they will take over from each other. I won't be intervening between uh, the two uh, presentations. 
and uh, Amako san will be in, um, advancing their slides as they as they speak. Um, so the first I'd like to introduce is Professor Helen Roy. Hopefully we can see her on the screen shortly. Hello, Helen. <laughs> and uh, Helen's joining us at about 6.30 in the morning in the UK, so very grateful for, for her time. Helen's from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and as mentioned, she's one of the three co-chairs of the assessment. So the way the assessments work is the, the three co-chairs, and then each chapter has coordinating lead authors, and as well as lead authors and contributing authors. Um, and our other expert is uh, Dr. Sankran Kavalitito. Uh, Sankran, see if you can join us as well. He's joining us from uh, Kerala in India, hopefully. Sankran, could you turn your camera on if you... Uh... Okay, there we go. Hello, Sankran. <laughs> So Sankran is from the Kerala Forest Research Institute, and he's one of the coordinating lead, uh, lead uh, coordinating lead authors for the chapter on management. So there are six different chapters. I won't go into all of them now. You'll probably hear about them soon. Uh, but this particular chapter deals with management aspects of invasive alien species. Um, and I've asked them to give us a bit of background on the assessments with the specific questions of what is the assessment about, so very basically, what are the key messages of the assessment and uh, which are especially relevant to Asia? So the assessment is a global assessment, uh, but we are especially focused uh, in, in ISAP on Asia. So where possible, they will focus uh, focus on Asia. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over to, I think, Helen, you're going to start, right? Please, yes, that's right. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be with you all and um, to be giving this presentation alongside um, Sankaran. And um, hopefully this will give you some of the headline messages from our assessment and lead to a very interesting discussion. Next slide, please. I think it's really important when um, we begin to discuss the assessment to actually go through the definition of what are invasive alien species. Next slide, please. So invasive alien species were identified by the global assessment back in 2019 as one of the five major drivers of biodiversity loss alongside climate change, for instance. And these are um, animals, plants, and other organisms that have been moved from one part of the world to another part of the world where they wouldn't have naturally occurred by human activities. So these are the alien species. A subset of those alien species are known to establish, to spread, and have some kind of negative impact on nature. But many of these invasive alien species also have impacts on people. Next slide, please. So just to go through some of the findings of the report and the next slide, please. So one of our headline messages is that people and nature are threatened by invasive alien species in all regions of Earth. So through chapter two, we compiled a lot of information on established alien species. Indeed, we were able to identify 37,000 established alien species that have been introduced into one part of the world or another by human activities. We're seeing 200 new alien species every year. Of that 37,000, 3,500 are considered to be invasive alien species. That is, they have some negative impacts on nature, but also on people in some cases. We also undertook um, a very large review um, in terms of um, Indigenous local knowledge, and we had some workshops um, which were absolutely wonderful alongside Indigenous peoples and local communities and gathered um, further information. And more than 2,300 invasive alien species are found on, on the lands of Indigenous peoples across all regions of Earth. And you can see from that figure just to the side that um, these species can impact in all cases nature, but in some cases also nature's contributions to people and also good quality of life. And indeed, you can see that some of the species have negative impacts on all three of those categories. Next slide, please. 
So the, the ways in which invasive alien species impact nature and people are, are varied. So there are a variety of different mechanisms, including changes to ecosystems, really very pronounced changes to ecosystems. And we can see at the bottom of the pictures um, over to the side of the slide, um, this is um, a small Atlantic Ocean, um, in Tolina, and growing throughout the cloud forest is a plant, New Zealand flax, which has really altered that ecosystem very, very dramatically, and um, not only affected the biodiversity, but also, for example, um, the water cycle there as well. So economies, food security, water security, human health, and cultural identities are profoundly and negatively affected by invasive alien species. One of our other findings around the impact side of things was that people with the greatest direct dependence on nature, including indigenous peoples and local communities, may be disproportionately affected by invasive alien species. So for example, we could see that the fall army worm, um, Spodoptera, increased labor and pesticide costs in North Sumatra in Indonesia. Next slide, please. So this is just to give some headline numbers on the impacts. And of global species extinctions, 60% have been caused solely or alongside other drivers by invasive alien species. We did a huge amount of work to try and come up with this figure of the estimated global annual cost of biological invasions, which we give here is $423 billion. But we consider this as the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many intangible costs that cannot be captured within this figure. Nevertheless, that is a very, very large figure. When we were um, going through in a very systematic way, um, documenting and looking at the impacts on nature, good quality of life and nature's contributions to people, we looked at the positive and also the negative impacts. And it's important to say that, of course, all these invasive alien species have negative impacts, but some of them might also have benefits in one way or another. But what we could see is that all of the impacts that we were able to um, document, 85% of the impacts on nature and good quality of life are negative, and 80% of the impacts on nature's contributions to people are negative. So that is, they are overwhelmingly negative. Next slide, please. So just to give a bit of a focus on um, the Asia Pacific region. So within the summary of policymakers, we include a figure looking at numbers of um, new arrivals, first records of alien species over time across a whole variety of um, different taxa. And we break this down into the different regions. So you might like to take a look at that um, in some more detail. But just as for all regions around the world, we can see that the numbers of alien animal species are increasing continuously for all taxonomic groups and all subregions of the Asia Pacific region. And this is likely to continue going forward into the future. Asia has the highest number of established alien mammals and one quarter of documented impacts from invasive alien species have been reported in the Asia Pacific region with the highest number of impacts on health. Extinction hotspots where invasive alien species are documented as the main cause are mainly located in the Asia Pacific region, about 73% of them. And it's important also to note that throughout the assessment, we um, noted where we had particular um, knowledge and data gaps. And we note that data on alien plants, invertebrates, microorganisms, fungi, and marine and freshwater species are quite scarce in the Asia Pacific region. Next slide, please. So when we move towards um, the later parts of the assessment and particularly looking to um, chapter six of the assessment, where we did a full and comprehensive review of policies, we can see that current policies have been insufficient in managing biological invasions and preventing and controlling invasive alien species. So in many countries, about 80%, have targets for the management of biological invasions within their natural bi national biodiversity strategies and action plans. But about 83% do not have national legislation or regulations directed specifically towards the prevention and control of invasive alien species. And nearly half of all countries do not invest in the management of invasive alien species. And so there's inadequate policy implementation due to limited capacity and resourcing. Next slide, please. So people are at the heart of this problem and it is a huge problem and a growing problem. 
many of our activities are facilitating the transport, the introduction, establishment and spread of invasive alien species. And we were able to make some predictions that if things remain unchanged by 2050, the total number of alien species globally is expected to be about a third higher than it was reported in 2005. But of course, we know that things aren't remaining unchanged. We know that many of the other drivers, both the direct and indirect drivers of change, are interacting with invasive alien species. And we can expect that this will amplify the threats and impacts of invasive alien species, and that actually that figure will be a lot worse. And we know from um, our extensive review that climate change will be a major cause of future increases in the risk of invasive alien species going forward. Thank you. Next slide, please. So here I'm delighted to hand over to Sankaran um, to give the more positive part of the assessment. Over to you, Sankaran. OK. Uh... Uh, we, we strongly believe that uh, prevention and control of invasive alien species are possible if we can allocate sufficient resources, if there's a strong political will and long-term commitment. And there are several management options to do this. Prevention is the best option and most cost effective also. It's possible through pathway management, uh, including pre-entry quarantine measures, control at the border, and post-entry biosecurity measures. Preparedness, which involves surveillance, risk analysis, early detection, and rapid control will also work in a wonderful way. The next option would be eradication through physical, chemical, and biological methods. And these will work wonderfully well uh, on islands. One example I can quote uh, is that of uh, French Polynesia, where er eradication of gods rats, cats, and rabbits were possible through eradication. And if eradication fails, we may try containment. And this method also fails. We can go for control through physical, chemical, and biological methods, or an integration of all these methods. A restoration of sites after successful management is mandatory in all cases. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, in the Asia Pacific region, management of biological inhibitions is uh, frustrated with a number of challenges. The first and foremost is the lack of an exclusive policy and legislation in most countries. And we lack authentic checklists of invasive alien species and lack of awareness. There is awareness, but it's not sufficient enough. Lack of capacity and capability, scarcity of resources, we are dependent on others, gaps in data and knowledge, especially of invasive alien invertebrates, uh, marine organisms, microorganisms, fungi, etc. And uh, there is a lack of coordination. Nobody knows. Uh, who will do what among government departments. These are all issues which need to be tackled on an urgent basis. Next slide, please. Yeah, IAS, as I told you, IAS can be managed through context-specific integrated government governance approach as we have discussed in chapter six of the assessment. And this need will resource coordinated and sustained strategic actions. They may enable us to attain the goals of the Kunming Monterey Global Biodiversity Framework. And the figure that we have shown here, the roots show the essential properties of the governance systems, 
which support the strategic action shown on the branches and the strategic action is uh, supposed to be achieved through these governance systems. Next slide, please. Overall, the IPBS assessment has brought forth compelling evidence that we must act immediately and sustainably to achieve the goal of management of product innovations. Next slide, please. The I expected impacts of the report. Next. The IPBS assessment is the first ever comprehensive report on the invasive alien species and their control. The report provides the best available evidence, critical analysis, and options to address the issue of biological innovation to all concerned, which include the governments, civil society, indigenous peoples and local communities, the general public, the private sector, and resource managers. In short, here is the opportunity. We are all concerned to act as early as possible to mitigate the threats. So next slide, please. We are hopeful that the findings of the report may contribute to achieving the international targets of biological innovations. The first one is target six of the Kunming Bombshield Global Biodiversity Framework. The second is implementation of sustainable development goals of the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development, especially goal number 15. Next slide, please. Next, please. Next, yeah. This is the process of the assessment. The assessment was developed over four years uh, with a dedicated work of all the authors, the coordinated lead authors, our coaches, and lead authors and uh, contributing authors, the TSU, the review editors, and all those at the management level. There were three author meetings, two external reviews, the participation of a large cross-section of IAS experts across the globe, and there was one additional review by the governments. Over 13,000 documents, which include peer-reviewed publications, books, gray literature, seminar proceedings, and information from indigenous and local knowledge were consulted in depth to prepare the report. We made it a point to engage with the indigenous and local knowledge by conducting three dialogue workshops, a call for contributions, and we also collaborate with the ILK experts and holders. Next, please. And there were 86 nominated experts from across the globe, including all regions from 47 countries with the different backgrounds, but all were um, say sure of one thing, uh, how to manage and how to go about managing invasive alien species. We have um, um, say gone for recording the impacts, the drivers, and then how to go about uh, say managing invasive alien species through integrated governance. There were about 200 contributing authors and we were amply supported, ably supported by a management committee, technical support unit based in Japan, um, that's part of the Institute for Global Environment Strategy, IBUS. Next, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sankar and, and Helen. I, I um, hope it was audible. It was. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. You could hear perfectly clearly. Thanks. And I think it was good on Zoom as well. Um, so I just had a couple of questions. We are running a little bit behind time, so I probably won't speak for as long as intended, but um, a couple of follow-up questions. Um, the first one uh, for you, Sankaran, so you're one of the coordinating lead authors of the chapter that's focused on management, but the assessment as a whole is global, right? And so I was just wondering, what is the, um, the, the um, variety in terms of management options when you look at different countries? Are all countries looking at roughly the same thing, or is there a lot of uh, variation from, from one to another? 
Yeah, yeah. Could you please repeat that question? I could not hear. Yeah, the question was regarding uh, how management differs from country to country or, or maybe region to region. Is there a big difference, um, or is it? Are you pretty much looking at the same thing uh, no matter which part of the world you're in? And I'm thinking in terms of variety. You know, you spoke about islands and mainlands. Um, you've also there's developing countries and developed countries. Uh, presumably, there there are quite different situations in terms of management. Is is that correct? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, regarding islands and uh, mainland, islands are particularly vulnerable to invasive alien species. 90% of all the recorded species extinctions have happened on islands. And one advantage is that detection of the presence of invasive alien species and the delimitation is quite easy on islands uh, because the area of the islands are small compared to the uh, uh, large land masses. Uh, in any case, species-based and site-based management options will work for islands. However, prevention is the best option, especially on islands. They should have a biosecurity system which will help them in the long step. If prevention fails, eradication will work the best because we have several success stories from islands. Over the 100 years, 88% of all the attempts on islands to eradicate invasive alien vertebrates have been successful. Hmm. As I told you earlier, one example is uh, French Polynesia, where they could uh, uh, eradicate all invasive alien vertebrates from the island. Uh, that's my answer to that question. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think it's... Uh... So the question could be asked more broadly, but I think it's good that you focus on that particular aspect because I think uh, people who are not familiar with the invasive alien species concept, I think, might not appreciate how critical islands are in terms of threat, but also in terms of the possibilities for management, as you've uh, very clearly demonstrated there. Um, okay, so let me just uh, move on to another question, really for perhaps for either of you, but let me start with Helen. Um, on uh, the term integrated governance, uh, so reading through the assessment, I saw this and also having uh, attended the workshops that we've both been uh, at recently and the call time as well, uh, this term comes up quite a lot. Um, but what does it mean exactly in the context of invasive alien species? Could you just sort of talk a little bit around that term and why it's important? Yes, thank you very much for the question. So you would have seen um, the the picture of the tree that um, Sankaran showed within the slides with these enabling properties and these strategic actions. And that's essentially our interpretation of integrated governance in the context of um, biological invasions. But in terms of the definition for um, integrated governance, which we outline, um, particularly through chapter six, but also summarized within the summary policymakers, essentially it's everyone working together. So integrated governance of biological invasions consists of establishing the relationships between the roles of actors, of different stakeholders, institutions, and instruments. And looking at the kind of interplay between people and nature um, to ensure that actions, um, these strategic actions are really um, acting on the biological invasions and their management. So I guess in summary, it's all about us all working together. And that tree demonstrated that, as Sankaran showed, that there are a number of kind of enabling properties that need to be in place, such as robust institutions, for instance, that will then allow the effective implementation of those strategic actions, which are in some senses relatively straightforward around, um, for example, partnership working, um, collaboration and um, coordination. Mm -hmm. Just staying on governance for, for a little while, um, the Invasive Alien Species IPIS report, like uh, previous IPIS reports, has a section on uh, on options, sort of the policy yes. options they're called sometimes, but I think in your case, governance options or perhaps yes. both. Um, so, and I know that uh, IPES is at pains to point out that they're not prescribing any of these. Uh, these are not uh, prescriptions for policy. They're just options that can be considered by policymakers. Um, but considering that um, uh, maybe slight sensitivity, you know, avoiding prescription, how, do you do, how did you decide on the governance options that you decided on? Like what made you sort of decide that these were the ones that you were going to uh, that you're going to suggest, at least, that, that uh, countries consider uh, employing? So we had an amazing team on Chapter 6, um, and they undertook a very structured approach. So they um, used a systematic review-type process 
um, and all of this is documented um, within the report and within a data management um, report as well. And essentially, they focused around four questions. And I'm just going to very quickly read those out to you. They mm -hmm. focused on what are the range of alternative governance response options for dealing with invasive alien species? What are the challenges facing invasive alien species governance? And what evidence is available on effective invasive alien species governance options? And what governance options are available for transformative progress towards meeting invasive alien species goals? And they reviewed they screened 321 papers that they found and they extracted the information specifically around those questions. But um, they were also able to look across, for example, the, 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 the members of the CBD parties to look specifically around progress towards um, national targets, for instance, but also international targets as well. And by doing that and looking to the indicators and seeing where progress had been made, they were able to then um, extract the, the main areas as to, to, to why progress perhaps had not been as we might all have wanted it um, to be. And then there were a number of aspects that came out from that that were very clear that um, if there were improvements made, particularly around, for example, resourcing, then um, better integrated governance for managing biological invasions could be achieved. And so all of this huge amount of information around those different questions, which is laid out in a lot of detail and, and I will say very well written and clearly written within um, chapter six, they were able to distill that down to these um, seven that you can see before us, um, strategic actions. Um, and again, obviously they're, they're, they're very much summarized within that tree diagram um, that um, Sankaran showed, but there's a lot more information that goes behind that. And just to very, rattle very quickly through the headlines of those, that there's enhanced coordination and collaboration, develop and adopt effective and achievable national implementation strategies, share efforts and commitments and understand the specific roles of actors, improve policy coherence, engage broadly across all stakeholders and indigenous peoples and local communities, resource innovation, research and technology, and support information systems, infrastructures and data sharing. And I think just as we heard um, from Sankran in response to your first question around the different um, management options, we can recognize that you know things are changing over time as well. There are new options becoming available and ensuring that um, through integrated governance that um, we are in the best position to take advantage of those options is part of that integrated governance. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um... I'd like to just jump on to uh, one so separate question to these. Perhaps we can get back to some of these in the in the open session later. Um, but we, I think, we're pretty much we could we could more or less uh, stay on time if we uh, just just do this one additional one here, which is um, and perhaps Sankran, I can start with you this time. Um, presumably, in the process of you know sort of four years of trawling through the literature, um, the grey literature, scientific literature, and speaking to people and everything, um, you would have the you would have got some idea of where the gaps are in terms of our knowledge of invasive alien species and, and how to deal with them. Um, can you tell us a bit, are there any particular gaps that come to mind? Maybe you can focus um, particularly on the management uh, side of things, and maybe you could focus a bit on, on, on Asia. Those are both your, your specialities, but uh, generally this idea of, of gaps. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, in, in the Asian region, for that matter, across the globe also, uh, there's a dearth of information on uh, invasive alien invertebrates mm -hmm. and uh, invasive alien marine organisms, microorganisms, and fungi. The gap is too big in the Asia-Pacific region. Unless uh, these gaps are uh, bridged, I don't think we'll be able to go for uh, proposing management options of these organisms. You said marine organisms as well, there, right? Yes. Which was a marine, okay. Right. Yeah, it, it's too difficult to study the marine organism. It's not easy. Where prevention is the only option to manage uh, invasive alien species in the marine system, the marine realm. Right. right. Whereas uh, we have a number of options in the terrestrial and close water systems. I see. And of course, the marine realm is so important because it's it's very often the the transport part of the equation right like it's the way that a lot of um 
organisms get from one place to another and are picked up along the way in ballast water and hull fouling and also in of course in in cargo itself right there are all these yeah. different ways right okay all right great um i think we're going to uh jump on to um our next section where hopefully as i said we can get back to a couple of these things but thank you very much maybe a quick round of applause for our speakers who will stay with us thank you thank you very much thank you Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, next I would like to introduce, uh, so our previous two speakers spoke one after the other. Our next two speakers will uh, speak separately, so I'll introduce them separately. And the first is Ms. Badia Ahmad Saeed, who is the Deputy Director for Preservation of Species and Genetics at the Ministry of Environment and Forest um, of Indonesia. Um, and uh, she's uh, kindly joined us to give us a bit of a, an Indonesian perspective. So we'll hear quite soon the Japanese perspective as well. Um, but Ms. Badia, very nice to, uh, to see you again. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, just to explain to the audience what I've uh, asked you, and I've asked the same question to Nakao san who will uh, speak after Ms. Badia. Uh, the question is basically how big a problem are invasive alien species in Indonesia and later uh, in Japan? Um, and uh, how are they addressed in, in policy and strategy and legislation? So these are the kind of core questions uh, that um, the presentations will answer, but we might, we might hear a little bit broader than that as well. Uh, so Ms. Badia, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. Please go ahead. Thank you, Andre. Uh, please uh, allow me to share screen. Okay, good afternoon, uh, distinguished uh, participant and speaker. And uh, firstly, I would like to thank to I guess for uh, inviting uh, us in uh, from Indonesia. Uh, I'm glad to see you in this session, uh, although in a Zoom platform. As uh, Sankaran uh, said earlier, uh, as a party that has ratified the CPD, uh, we know that one of the decision of the COP15 CPD is the agreement on Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which uh, one of the target is reducing the rate of introduction and establishment of other non uh, or potential invasive alien species by at least 50% by 2030. Based on research so far, uh, the three top, uh, the number of invasive alien species have been uh, recorded in the Asian region. Uh, 187 species recorded in Indonesia and 148 species recorded in the Philippines, and 145 species recorded in uh, Malaysia. The highest number of uh, invasive alien species and high species endemicity make Indonesia more uh, vulnerable to the negative impact of invasive alien uh, species. As uh, Helen uh, said, uh, uh, Earlier, uh, 187 years in Indonesia consists of uh, 97 plants, uh, 15 animals, and 75 uh, pieces that have been recorded in the list of uh, Minister of Environment and Forestry Regulation number uh, 94 uh, concerning invasive alien species in Indonesia that uh, all of them had been uh, assessed by risk assessment. Uh, yeah, we uh, we know that uh, there is a little a study uh, conducting in uh, marine species. So uh, the number uh, maybe will be increased uh, in the next uh, time. Uh, Talking about the invasive alien species, uh, more than 50% of uh, protected area also have been invaded by invasive alien species. And the most uh, severe uh, case in Balura National Park where uh, Acacia nilotica has invaded uh, the grassland that serve as a food for banting, a key species in this national park. Uh, 
in Ujung Pulau National Park, we also have uh, invasive uh, alien species issues that uh, Arenga obtusifolia invaded the Javan rhino food. Yeah, as uh, uh, Sankaran and Helen also said uh, earlier, that invasive alien species cause harm across a wide range of environmental and human activities, such as food security, health, and bio biodiversity. As I mentioned uh, before, that in Ujung Kulon National Park and then uh, Baluran National Park, also uh, Bromo Tengger National Park, uh, also uh, have a several case uh, invited by. Uh, invasive alien species. Uh, the progress of policy uh, st strengthening uh, undertaken by Indonesian government uh, since Indonesia ratified the CBD and subsequently received a mandate to develop uh, NBSAP, we have uh, begun uh, incorporating this issue of managing invasive alien species into the national planning. And uh, this year, uh, a review has been conducted on the Minister of Environment and Forestry Regulation uh, to updating the list of the invasive alien species and doing uh, some uh, risk assessment. In uh, this year also, uh, to enhance uh, supervision over invasive alien species, uh, government has been issued the government regulation number 29 uh, this year. And to strengthen the implementation, uh, the government of Indonesia also issued uh, the government regulation number one uh, on mainstreaming biodiversity conservation into the sustainable uh, development. To strengthen uh, the policies, uh, we also doing the mapping stakeholders uh, role. Uh, we uh, not only involve uh, some ministries uh, to involve in uh, managing and governing the invasive alien species, but also universities and then uh, NGO private sector uh, and also uh, association. Some initiative uh, on invasive alien species management in the ASEAN region, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia uh, already have a strat national strategic action plan in uh, especially invasive uh, species alien species management and uh, for Cambodia and uh, Myanmar uh, incorporated with the NBSA and uh, the last year when Indonesia uh, served as a ASEAN chairmanship uh, Indonesia uh, co corporate with uh, ASEAN Center for Biodiversity uh, appointed as a leader to develop regional uh, action plan for invasive alien species uh, management uh, that uh, aim uh, to reduce negative impact of invasive species on the environment, economy, and society of the ASEAN member state. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Badia. So I'll uh, introduce now Carlson, so, so stick around. And so soon after this, I'll uh, sit down and ask both of you a couple of questions. Uh, but before that, I'd like to introduce our last speaker, uh, Ms. Fumiko Nakao, who is the uh, Senior Analyst for Biodiversity Information at the Nature Conservation Bureau of Japan's Ministry of Environment. And she's also been very centrally involved in uh, the organization and uh, coordination of a series of uh, workshops on invasive alien species. So I think, Nakao san, uh, your life has been revolving around uh, invasive alien species for the past uh, few months. It'd be interesting to hear what you have to say about Japan. And the questions were really the same questions that I asked uh, to uh, Ms. Badia. Uh, looking forward to, to seeing your presentation. Would you like to stand at the podium? Uh, 
uh, Andre, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, I'm Fumiko Nakao. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, I'd like to introduce a broad picture of Japanese policy on IAS. Um, in Japan, we identified uh, four uh, major crises uh, facing biodiversity, and one of the uh, the one uh, one one of it is uh, uh, brought by human beings, uh, which is represented by IAS. Japan had an act that specifically focuses on IAS, which was enacted in 2005, considering that 83% of countries don't have national legislation focusing on IAS, according to the IPBES assessment report. I believe this shows how committed Japan uh, is to IAS control. The aim of the act is to prevent damages caused by IAS to ecosystems, human safety, and agriculture, forestry, and fishery. The target species of the act are called the designated IAS. For designated IAS, these activities are raging, transportation, storing, importing, releasing, transferring, or sales are prohibited. We also have identified and listed unevaluated alien species. Those who want to import unevaluated alien species have to notify the Ministry of the Environment in advance. When we receive a such notification, we organize an expert committee to evaluate the risks of introduction of the species and take necessary measures. Currently, we identified more than 150 designated IAS. Uh, this is not only species, but some, uh, some, someone is, some are the group of species. Um, Japan has amended several times with the act, and the most recent amendment are the strengthening to strengthen our management of IAS. By the amendment, two subset of designated invasive alien species were created. Uh, first is to fight against the increasing number of the introduction of lead imported firearms. The regulatory authority of designated IAS as a whole was expanded. Moreover, the designated IAS are requiring urgent actions with even stronger uh, regulatory authority was specified by the government ordinance. Second, dealing with red swamp crayfish and red-eared strider turtles has been a long-standing issue for Japan since these IAS were already kept widely as pets by broad people in Japan. This means that the application of the current regulation, uh, such as uh, a prohibition of raising, storing, transporting, might foster the release of these species uh, by those people who are currently raising them as a pet. Also, of course, uh, also if these uh, people apply for uh, permission, uh, we may uh, permit uh, their uh, keeping as a pet, but Mm, probably we, we are afraid not many people will apply for our permission. So we create a new category at the uh, um, designated IAS with conditions, uh, which means only importing and releasing and sales are prohibited for these um, categories. And third, uh, through local, although local governments play a very important role in IAS management, uh, the current uh, I mean, the uh, previous act uh, didn't specify the role of uh, people other than national government. So we, uh, the new amendment act specified responsibility for various entities, uh, local, such as uh, local governments, uh, business, and uh, ordinary peoples.
Um, as I explained, for about 20 years, Japan has been strengthening its national policies through uh, enhanced regulations, border, border controls, and public awarenesses. Of course, we are fully aware that it's more cost-effective to prevent the introduction of IRs than to eradicate them after their establishment. However, it's very difficult for one country alone uh, to deal with transboundary movements of IAS. This is why we have been leading the G7 initiative, as Andre just mentioned about, on IAS at the G7 presidency, to further enhance international cooperation and engagement by a wide, uh, wider range of sectors, and to develop a more effective and efficient response to IAS. With the continuous cooperation from G7 members, uh, Ministry of the Environment Japan has promoted G7 initiatives on IAS this year. Following the open online webinar uh, and the CBD established a 25 uh, side events uh, in Nairobi, uh, we uh, continuously promoting this initiative. And finally, at the coordinate of this event, we organized a G7 workshop on IAS uh, last month in Tokyo. It was a three-day workshop. On this occasion, I'd like to uh, thank IG, IGES uh, for your kind support, which was indispensable for successful organization of uh, this G7 workshop. Um, so the outcome of this uh, G7 workshop uh, was a statement uh, which specified our continuous um, commitment uh, to strengthening our cooperation and extend our activity to wider sectors and countries. Japanese presidency of G7 will end this month because uh, it's an uh, annual, annual thing. So, But the G7 members are aiming to continue working while engaging with a variety of countries I, I just mentioned. So Japan is also committing uh, to support uh, next presidency and in the future presidency. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Nakasa. And actually, Nakasa, you can just take a seat here because we'll go straight into the question and answer session and I will do the same thing. Okay, um, so uh, Nakao san would just like to introduce her colleague, please go uh, ahead. Yes, uh, I'm not good at numbers, so I <laughs> the, the very detailed thing. So I, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Mr. Fujita. Uh, he's working on the IS issues. Thanks very much for joining us, Fujita san. Okay, so, um, and uh, Ms. Badia is uh, back with us as well. Okay, um, I just had a, a couple of questions and uh, really just to kind of stimulate a short discussion here. Um, and some of them have been answered to some extent in the presentations. Um, but the first one I wanted to ask was um, to Japan and to, to Indonesia, and perhaps I can start with you, uh, Nakao-san. Uh, you, you showed some specific species there, the crayfish and the fire ants and a couple of others. Um, which which species is, is the biggest challenge in, in Japan? Is there a particular one which everyone is kind of focused on or uh, or not? Uh, the big uh, the species. Uh, yeah, probably the uh, red imported variants. Yeah, because it's really risky. Uh, it may cause a serious problem to our, uh, not only ecosystem, but also the human health as well as uh, societies. Uh, it may cause a big problem, economic problem too. It's a relatively recent problem as well, right? Or is that correct? Or is it how long has it been? Uh, I think it was uh, since 2015. Uh, very, very recent. Right? Okay. It's just interesting how this differs from country to country. And, and also, as you were speaking, I was noting that, um, so I'm from South Africa originally, and uh, invasive alien species has been a focus there for a long time, but the focus is almost completely on plant species. Uh, and there are more than 300 um, invasive plant species, very, very little focus on animals. And the animal focus is um, limited to invertebrates. So it's interesting that some countries seem much more animal focused and others more, more plant focused. 
Uh, and in Japan's case, it seems like it's more animal focused, right? Most of the, the problem species are animal species. At least the examples that you provided are all animal species, right? Yeah, but uh, we also uh, had some uh, designated invasive alien species for plants. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let me ask the same question to, to you, Ms. Badia. Uh, could you just give us an idea of which are the the main species, which species or which groups of species are, are the really the, the, the big uh, target for invasive alien species uh, action in, in Indonesia? Yeah, um, yes, uh, as uh, Helen uh, presentation that uh, the species, uh, the the most target is uh, Spodoptera frugre uh, perda that uh, attack uh, most of the crop uh, especially in uh, Sumatra, and uh, and uh, as I uh, also present in my presentation that Acacia nilotica and Arenga optusifolia uh, invaded uh, the ecosystem or the food plant of uh, not only uh, Javan rhino uh, in uh, Ujung Pulau National Park but also uh, other mammals uh, in uh, Ujung Kulon National Park. Uh, several uh, case in uh, Baluran National Park that uh, Acacia uh, invited uh, for the uh, feeding uh, ground of the Banteng, uh, a key species in uh, Baluran National Park. I, uh, I said that it is a uh, many efforts we uh, do to uh, mitigate and to eradicate uh, the Acacia nilotica for uh, years. For a long time, we uh, invest many efforts uh, to eradicate uh, Acacia uh, nilotica. So it's very sad for me to hear about Acacia nilotica because this is a species native to my country, which I actually studied many years ago. So, and it's the first time I heard about it being in, uh, such a big problem. I didn't even realize that. And that's an interesting thing about invasive species is that all of these species are native somewhere. Uh, it's all about the place where they are and the place that they're able to adapt to, right? That makes them a problem. Okay, uh, that's why I find it so fascinating to hear how this differs from, from country to country. Um, another question about um, how countries differ and uh, Ms. Badia, maybe I can stay with you uh, for now. Um, how would you say um, Indonesia is different or, or unique in terms of, of your way of, of addressing invasive alien species? Uh, and the reason I ask this is because countries have a lot to learn from each other. But are there any uh, approaches that you've taken which, you, which are fairly unique to, to Indonesia in terms of uh, managing invasive alien species? Uh, yeah, you, you're muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Andre. Uh, the uniqueness of uh, Indonesia in dealing with the uh, invasive alien species uh, management is, uh, as you know, that uh, Indonesia is an archipelagic uh, country uh, with a very large population. So uh, the pathway of... Uh, entering the invasive alien species could be numerous, making control efforts uh, very, very uh, challenging. Uh, and also because uh, conflicting interests and value between ecology and uh, economic, I think it is a challenge uh, to uh, engage many uh, stakeholders uh, to uh, aware that uh, it is important to be uh, managed uh, comprehensively. Yeah, it's a very interesting aspect. The fact that uh, Indonesia is an archipelago, Sankaran was talking earlier on about how islands are particularly susceptible. Indonesia is not an island, it's thousands of islands, right? So you've got this problem sort of multiplied and that really puts a whole new uh, angle on things. Um, now, Carl san uh, in the case of, of Japan, are there any and a particularly unique uh, uh, focuses of policy and strategy? Yes, uh, one thing is, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, we are now starting to control uh, the 
uh, the already widespread IAL such as um, the red ear turtles. Um, but our focus is more, uh, our, we focus more the, uh, the uh, uh, early detection and uh, yes, uh, to avoid the introduction. And in that case, uh, we need the uh, involvement of wider sectors. As you just mentioned about integrated governance, uh, we really think uh, the participation from business sectors are important. Um, that's why uh, under our G7 presidency, we invited uh, TNFD secretariat. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows the TNFD. It's a task force on uh, nature-related financial information disclosures. And uh, they just released the report uh, indicating, uh, uh, recommending uh, the indicator re uh, related to IAS uh, to be included in their uh, business report. And we really hope this kind of trend will push our efforts to involve business sectors. Thanks very much. Um, a, a little bit of a different question, um, and specifically on, on the report. Uh, and Ms. Batia, I'd like to uh, throw the microphone back to you this time. Um, the Invasive Alien Species report from EPBES has been out now for a few months. Um, and uh, it's all the chapters are not sort of completely laid out, but they're all available online. So all of the information is available online now, uh, as well as a summary for policymakers, which is a summarized version of the report. Um, do you know of ways in which Indonesia is planning to use this report? So I guess another way of saying that would be what difference is this report going to make to the way that Indonesia addresses the invasive alien species challenge? Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, Indonesia can use the report of uh, IPES uh, assessment uh, as a reference to address and incorporating into the national policy uh, to review uh, some uh, regulation uh, and uh, putting into the uh, national planning how to address the issues. Uh, and I think uh we also can use the report uh, to uh increase awareness uh, among uh, various uh policy makers uh, and <clears throat> also stakeholders uh, since uh the epes report uh, also contain the best practice so we can uh using uh them as a reference also <clears throat> Right, and I guess that you've hinted at this as well, and so did uh, Helen and Sankran, that uh, what's really unique about the report is it's the first time that all of this information is gathered in one place, uh, that uh, it's, a, it's the most comprehensive view of this problem and how to deal with this problem that's ever been produced. And this is, I think, um, EPES in general is very important in this regard. You know, this information is all out there, if you're prepared to look for it. Um, but uh, the authors went through literally thousands or tens of thousands of papers uh, to find the information that they have uh, synthesized in this report. Um, so uh, potentially a very important resource for, for policymakers. Um, I think uh, I'm just going to ask one more question before I open the floor to questions. And by the way, please, if you're on Zoom, uh, please, at any stage, as I said, feel free to, uh, to write your questions and perhaps mention who you'd like to ask as well. Um, but before I do open the floor, um, actually, I see there's a, there's a hand up already. Maybe, maybe I will open the floor now because this is, this is actually the time when I was planning to do that. So I'm going to ask uh, people in the room first, and we have one, one hand. So please go ahead. Would you mind introducing yourself as well, please? Uh, my name is Atiya Sofron. I'm uh, a teacher. I would like to ask the Japanese and also the uh, Indonesian girl, uh, woman, uh, what was the evolution of the invasive? Uh, how how many have they find when and how many are there now? Okay, so, so you're asking for numbers. Numbers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. And perhaps uh, Helen and Sankran, would you like to join us uh, again? The, these questions will be uh, for you as well. And and also, um, if the two of you would like to ask questions to Nakao-san and 
and Ms. Badia and, and vice versa, um, then you're welcome to do that. Um, Ms. Badia, do you have any, this might be a tricky question to answer off the cuff like this, but do you have any idea of the, of the numbers that, uh, that were asked about now in Indonesia? Uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, Andre. Uh, how many numbers? Of yeah, so um, the question. Uh, please uh, repeat the question. Okay, so so let me just rephrase the question. Sorry, so so you did in your presentation you did show uh, the numbers, the current number of species. But I guess the question is more about how has that changed over time. Do you have an idea of how the number of, of invasive species has increased over time? Has it been sudden or slowly over many decades? Do you have any idea? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we uh, can inventory or uh, can uh, update the list of the invasive alien species. Uh, when we are uh, doing uh, some uh, risk assessment study when uh, our colleague in uh, the field in a national park or in uh, surrounding the national park or protected area of one uh, the potential uh, species that uh, already invaded and then we are uh, doing the review of the list of the invasive alien species uh, and and then we uh, put it uh, them into the uh, regulation. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Nakao san, can we ask you the same question? Thank you. Yes, I asked my colleague. Um, so I, as I explained, the um, designated IAS is around one hundred fifty. And besides that, we identified uh, around 330 uh, invasive alien species, which needs uh, your attention. So we listed up there, we, we listed up these species as well, and call for attention to especially business sectors Thank you. and local communities and local governments. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, any other questions from the floor here? Uh, yep. Please just let us know who you are as well. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I am working for uh, education service to raise awareness of uh, diversity loss and climate change. And sometimes I do to I do the workshop for random public and sometimes do it for company employees. But is there any like specific advices or some um, actions? to tell them like what to do to improve the situation or to um, to prevent the newly introduced ones. So you said you really want to uh, business sectors to move forward for this problem, but I actually have very few ideas what exactly uh, I should tell to them. So if you have any um, advices, advice, please. Please. So I think I'll, I'll ask Nakao san to respond first, but Helen and Sankran and Ms. Badia might also have uh, some input. Please, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much for your important questions. Uh, with regard to the uh, red imported firearms, uh, because it comes from other countries, so we invited a business sector, especially the, um, those who are working at the port, uh, how to identify and what to do if you find a potential uh, harmful ants, those kind of things. So we uh, already developed uh, some educational material to provide them. And with regard to other um, species like uh, the red ear turtles and crayfish, uh, we uh, collaborated with the education uh, ministry for culture and education uh, to provide materials for kids. And also uh, we created a variety of uh, educational material, edu uh, public uh, awareness uh, materials on our website, uh, such as uh, YouTube and, uh, and you, may, you, uh, you may find some useful um, materials uh, which you can utilize to your activities on our website. So please visit. 
Thanks very much. So that's a Japan specific answer, which maybe that's what you're asking, but I would be curious about the same thing at an international level. Um, anyway, uh, Helen, you were nodding the most vigorously there. Would you like yeah. to start? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's a really excellent question. And I think it's really important that um, we engage people um, with this problem. And indeed, you know, we're so dependent on um, their behaviours in terms of addressing it um, to, to an extent. And to just to say that um, we're really fortunate with the IPBES assessment on invasive alien species that um, we are producing an educational web portal and it's the first time for an IPBES assessment that this has occurred um, and it's looking really wonderful. It's almost um, complete and um, people will be able to take a look at it very soon and if they would like to provide a translation to their own languages um, that will also be a possibility um, as well. So that's something to look out for um, very soon. Um, but also we've produced a number of fact sheets um, which are now available online and indeed one of those was on um, businesses and really recognizing the difference that businesses can make in particular um, and you know some of the actions that are described throughout the assessment that have applicability in other ways such as through risk assessments, for example. So if a business is going to be trading in a particular species, ensuring that they've carried out um, a comprehensive risk assessment um, before doing so is, is a really important um, action to take. But also throughout um, the report, we outline a number of um, biosecurity actions that are really practical for anyone um, to undertake and ensure that they're not moving species um, unintentionally around with them as they're traveling. You know, for example, if um, someone is going hiking in the mountains to make sure that their boots are very, very clean, um, whether or not they have returned from another country or not, that's a good thing to do. Um, but really just some very simple biosecurity actions. And I think around, you know, we've heard a little bit about pet ownership um, today as well and really compelling um, pet owners to be responsible for their pets yeah. is important. And, you know, for example, with the ready at sliders that we heard about, we also hear that they are released. We know that they are also released in other countries around the world. And indeed, that's that's not great for their welfare. Um, so I think compelling pet owners to take responsible actions, but also others as well to ensure that they take these simple actions is really important. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. And just a quick note on the, the fact sheets that you mentioned, those are presumably available on the IPES website, right? Yes, they are. So these okay. fact sheets are essentially a distillation of information from the summary of policymakers around specific mm -hmm. themes. So, for example, businesses. We also have one on islands, for instance, um, that is now available. Okay. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, we have the hard copies outside the door here. There are some fact sheets, but maybe it's not those fact sheets. I could be... Uh, on invasive alien species, yeah. Is it? Ah, sorry, yeah, sorry. These are for for um, uh, different IPES assessments, not uh, not on that. But at least you can see the format. Those of you who are here will be able to see the format that's used for the fact sheet. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Sankran or Ms. Badia, would either of you like to add to that? Uh, Sankran, we haven't heard from you for a little while. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I think. Uh, the Asia Pacific region requires a lot of awareness raising regarding invasive alien species. We have been doing quite a lot by publishing pest fact sheets and books and all that. But even now, uh, if a farmer or a layman comes across a, a, a new species which he has not seen in his surroundings for a long time, I mean, he is facing the problem who to consult, whether it should be the forest department, whether it should be the agriculture department, and then finally, it comes to us, the Kerala Forest Research Institute, where we have a cell for invasive alien species. But this should not be the way. The government should act. There should be a policy. There should be a governance system to act on that. And identification is a big problem because just because we cannot identify the invasive alien species, we are not able to act on it. Especially, there is no early detection. So there is no rapid response also. It's not it's not working anyway. Even at our airports, nobody checks for checks you for things <coughs> things that you carry from abroad, whether you carry seeds and things like that. They are only worried about gold and uh, currency. So this is not at practice. We have been uh, suggesting, advising the government to um, do this at a, a priority level 
because there should be checking at the airports, even at the state borders, there is no domestic quarantine. So there are certain basic things to be observed before we can go and introduce or go and uh, practice the IPBS recommendations. First and foremost is there is no legislation. There is no policy. This is a problem. We have been trying from the state of Kerala, our level best to carry the message across. And we are now planning to include a lesson on invasive alien species in, in uh, school level, primary and secondary school and even college level. That's what we are going to do now. Thank you. So, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, just, it strikes me that um, invasive alien species actually provide an opportunity to get people out into nature. You know, it's, it's a way of, um, if, if you have, especially have a, if you have a few specific species that are, that are a problem in a, an area, whether it's localized or not, um, if you make the population aware of that particular species, uh, especially for kids, it can actually be kind of a motivation to get outside and look for these uh, these creatures and at the, at, in the process of doing so, maybe help to get rid of them, but also, uh, you know, to discover nature uh, more generally. So it's more of a comment than a, than a question. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Uh, can I add on that? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have been doing this in schools in Kerala. We have been giving projects to um, secondary school level to go and identify um, alien species in your school premises and report back to the teacher so that they can consult with whether it's an invasive alien species or just an alien species. There are several alien species, naturalized species. They are not invasive sometimes. So this, we have been, but so India, is, as you know, is a large country. It, it's not easy to mimic it or take it to other states. We can tell them, uh, we can convene meetings and advise them. So we are doing our little best uh, uh, in our small setup. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Ms. Badia, anything from your yes. side about awareness raising? Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there are some action uh, in Indonesia doing to uh, prevent uh, entering the invasive alien species. Uh, just this year, uh, government of Indonesia uh, established uh, one agency uh, we call uh, quarantine bureau that uh, merge uh, some ministries into uh, one gate uh, supervision to prevent uh, enter the potential invasive alien species. And the other action is uh, uh, we have a regulation to all visitors uh, come to a national park uh, forbidden to uh, bring uh, fruit or uh, seeds uh, in, into the national park. And uh, the other uh, action, uh, actually uh, like in uh, Japan, we also have uh, some uh, education to campaign and uh, introduce uh, the potential uh, alien, uh, invasive alien species to the uh, community surrounding uh, uh, in a protected area, also uh, uh, students, uh, both in uh, elementary school or uh, secondary uh, school also. Oh, great. Thank you. So, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like there are activities going on all over the place. Um, okay, I just want to quickly, so we have uh, someone I have not introduced yet is Rohit Ramachandran, who is sitting, working very hard in the corner here next to Amakosan. He's taking notes, but he's also keeping an eye on uh, any questions that have come in online, but that's it, none so far. Okay, so we haven't received any Zoom questions. We do, however, have a bit of time left. So if there's anyone else in the room who has a question, and also um, perhaps I don't see any hands now, so okay, Amika, Amika please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mika. I'm with the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. Um, and I guess I have a question about sort of, I, I, I heard from many of the speakers that there may be cultural conflicts um, and, and issues of animal welfare when dealing, when managing um, alien species. And one of the things that I think about from my home country, Singapore, is um, during sort of the... Um, I'm not so sure, but I think this is a religiously linked practice that people would release animals in a 
in a sense of sort of um, to uh, get rid of their sins, they would release captured animals. So are there um, discussions about working with religious groups about these kinds of um, management or behavioral uh, issues that may lead to IAS? Did you want to direct that in any particular speaker or whoever's keen to answer? Okay. Would anyone like to take that one on? Uh, well, I'm happy to say um, a little on that. So um, there are, it's it's a really excellent question. There, of course, are quite a number of examples where there may be conflicts um, around the, the threat posed by a particularly invasive alien species. And of course, some species have been introduced intentionally for their benefits to people. And so these as well can be seen to be um, of value to people, even if they are then going on um, to pose a threat in one way or another. So I think there are many different groups and I have heard about um, the practice of um, releasing um, animals as, as was described. Um, I'm not aware of specific activity um, to raise awareness with those particular um, communities. But I think that, as we've just heard, generally raising awareness amongst all kinds of stakeholders is extremely important. And I think the other aspect that's really important as well that we highlight throughout um, the assessment is the importance of co-developing solutions for invasive alien species. And for example, we know that in some cases, eradication campaigns can cause um, some conflicts amongst different groups with ethical and welfare concerns, but also um, conservation concerns. But um, we really see, and the evidence points to, um, that if people get together and they make the decisions collectively and through a co-development process, then the management on the ground will be much more effective. And I think that, you know, that applies whether or not it may be through a religious practice and then co-developing uh, an approach um, to ensure that people can still fulfill their, their own needs, but in a way that is not damaging to the environment is really important. Thanks, Helen. Would anyone else like to add? Uh, maybe just raise your hand. I, I'm just seeing your picture. So Ms. Badia, would you like to add to that? Or? Yeah. Uh -huh. Actually, in Indonesia, we haven't uh, yet a uh, specific uh, case uh, uh, regarding the cultural, but uh, when we are uh, doing the risk assessment, one aspect is uh, to uh, communicate with uh, local uh, people and uh, some uh, knowledge uh, regarding the invasive alien species come to uh, uh, come from uh, local uh, community uh, and uh, I think it is uh, important that uh, like uh, Borneo or Kalimantan uh, because we uh, have a specific culture so uh, communicating with when uh, we uh, doing the risk assessment uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, interest. Uh, we interest to uh, communicate with uh, culture, uh, with people uh, come from the local. Thank you, Andre. Thanks very much. And um, I wanted to ask one other question. I don't see any hands in the room, but I just had a a question of my own. Actually, sorry, Nakasa, would you like to add to that? Yeah, please go ahead. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, as you just mentioned, we Japanese as a uh, some temple are releasing in uh uh invas not invasive but uh, alien species golden golden fish uh, to the pond but uh, uh in Nara prefecture famous uh as a famous temple a priest realized it may harm the uh ecosystems so uh the priest uh took to the experts at the university, and now they started to release not the golden fish, which is alien species, but uh, uh, local fish. Well, that's, a, that's a very good solution because you're stopping the problem but also helping something. Right? Oh, very interesting. Um, I had a, a separate question, and uh, Sankwan, I'm not sure if you wanted to add to the previous one. Feel free, but um, let me just add one on top of that, and it's a uh, I spurred by something that Helen said, you know, this idea of um, yeah, mm, okay. of, of, co 
Uh, do, you, do you want to do you want to start? Do you want to go yeah, ahead? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, okay. I think I yeah I will give my view. Ethical consideration um, has not been an issue as far as India is concerned because we have not started it. We have not started killing animals as invasive Indian species, but we have <coughs> conflict species. Some of the plants which are used by the local community for the livelihood, they are invasive, and then we are not permitted to manage them. This is an issue uh, with us, and it has been a very difficult problem because the invasive illness which is spreading like a wildfire everywhere. No native species can grow under it. It's Prosopis juliflora. You may have heard about it. So people use it for making charcoal, and it's the only livelihood for some of the uh, local people. So we are not supposed to manage them, either by chemical treatment, biological, so this is uh, one issue that we are facing. We have been trying to convince uh, those people that uh, they are doing more damage than the benefits. The benefit, the, the, the negative impacts overweigh the benefits, but we have not yet been very successful in that. We are continuing. Thank you. That's, a, that's actually exactly what I was going to ask, but I was going to use a different example, uh, even more impactful example, which is the, the famous Nile perch in Lake Victoria in, in East Africa. So this is just a bit of background. This is a invasive, big invasive spe fish species, which is, as Helen and Sankran can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I think it's responsible for the largest number of vertebrate extinctions of any species. So it's, it's, it's gotten rid of many of the native fish species, the cichlid fish species. Yeah. Um, which are much, much smaller. But the thing is that this uh, Nile perch is also a very good food fish, um, and it provides a, a huge amount of protein for uh, literally millions of people around the lake. So this lake borders three different countries, and it's even exported. You know, so much of the fish is uh, produced that it's even exported. So here's a, uh, an invasive alien species which is causing incredible ecological damage, but it's also um, it's very heavily relied on by the local situation. So I'm not sure, Helen, I was thinking um, of you when I was thinking of this question, but is that, that this is perhaps an extreme example, but, but how does one address that kind of situation where the, there's such, such huge trade-offs between uh, different uh, goals? Yeah, it's a really um, tough question. And I think that we're seeing around the world as well other ways in which people are having to adapt to particular invasive alien species and they might be adapt by for example they might adapt by for example using that species in the way you've described it provides uh, the Nile perch provides a good source of protein for people and there are other um, examples around the world where we can see that people are using the invasive alien species and in some senses that may be exerting some kind of control on that species as a consequence but there are other regions of the world where people are shying away from the idea of using the invasive alien species because they don't want to create a market around a particular species. So I think it's a really, really complex um, problem. I think as well with the Nile perch that it really highlights that once an invasive alien species has um, established and spread, it can be really difficult to manage it. And this can be the, in aquatic environments, for example, when we see in marine environments that the only really effective way to manage invasive alien species is to prevent their arrival in the first place. So actually with something like the Nile perch, eradication at this particular point in time would be extremely difficult. And of course, as you outline, um, people are um, getting some benefits from it. But Overwhelmingly, the evidence from the report was that although people are adapting to some of these invasive alien species, it's by necessity, not because in any way they would have had a desire to um, adapt to its use. So it's, you know, I, I think the Nile perch really highlights the magnitude of the threat of invasive alien species to nature, but also um, to people. And we know that there are many other problems um, within that lake with invasive alien species as well, such as water hyacinth. And indeed, we start to see interactions between different species um, exacerbating the problems of one another. So it's, it's, yeah, a very, very difficult situation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're just on time now. Um, so if anyone is, is really keen to add to that answer, perhaps a 30 second uh, add on. If not, I think now would probably be a good place to stop, but uh, let me just give you one last chance. 
Okay, I don't see any hands going up. So with that, I just wanted to uh, extend a really warm thank you to our speakers joining us from all over the world at all times of the of the day. Uh, round of applause. And uh, and uh, to Nakao san as well and Fujita san for joining us. Thank you very much. And of course to all of you for attending the session online and in person. Thanks very much. Um, so just quickly before you go, those of you who are with us physically, just a reminder that uh, at five o'clock, which is in 10 minutes time, uh, there'll be the closing session in room 503, the big uh, room down the way here, um, where we'll be looking back at ISAP with a younger generation. Uh, and there's an online link to the, uh, in the chat to, to the session as well, if those of you online would like to join. So please uh, feel free to join us. And uh, thanks one more time and goodbye to those of you online. Nice to see you Thank again. You. Thank you, Andrew. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I'll speak Thank up. you.